Thank you, Heather. Uh, so I take over here. Uh, <clears throat> about this ele battery electric guideline, what is this about? First of all, it's not a standard that say that you must do like this. It's rather a school book that say that you, you should do like this, you could do like this. This is best practice. And these are pros and cons for different, uh, different alternatives. Uh, so I say it's not stopping you in any way, but it's uh, describing how you could do it, how you, uh, a go good idea. It's like having a, uh, uh, <clears throat> say, a older brother um, at your shoulder and saying, go, do like this, don't do like this. So I can go to the next slide. See, the scope of a guideline. It's of course battery electric vehicles. And with batteries, it's mostly about lithium ion batteries, different version of lithium ion uh, batteries. Uh, we are not covering hybrids. Uh, we, are cover we are mentioning tethered and trolleys, but not going so much into deep depth of that. So it's mostly purely battery electric vehicles. And it's a guideline for underground mining, of course. But much of it is also applicable for surface mining. So it's much useful information for surface mining. And there will be a version four in some years. And if that will include surface mining or if it will be a surface mining guideline separate, that's up to the member of DMD, all the companies that was on the previous slide to decide. And it's a global guideline, so it does not cover all uh, local regulations, but we mentioned some of uh, the most important that we have stumbled over. But if we, turn, we try to be as global as possible with a guideline. And as I said, it's not a standard we say that you must do, it's uh, say what you could do, what you should do. So we can take the next one. Actually, yeah, see with that one, yeah. So what's new in this uh, version three compared to version two? First of all, we are rearranged much of the stuff to make it easier to follow the red thread. Because it's a long document, it's much information. It's uh, about 120 pages with inf important information. Uh, and of course, it's almost four years since we wrote the last version. So much have happened. So there's a lot of changes all over the document. I think all all sections are all chapters are changed in some perspective. Next slide. Uh, so we have highlighted more about uh, safety, better fire and electric safety mostly, uh, and highlighted the safety risks and also how to manage the risks. Uh, also, there's more written about charging, maintenance, trading, and st stuff around the actual vehicle. So that's more, much more. That part has been much extended. Next slide. Another part that has been extended is about business case. Uh, we'll talk more about that uh, later on. We also added a section about automated connectors, charger connector, and battery connectors in, in general. So this was a very short introduction of what's new in the, and now we will go through the, the guidelines section by section, try to cover 120 pages in a relatively short number of minutes. So I leave Martin to start with that. Thanks Anders. Um, my name is Martin Verhoeven. I work for McLean, uh, but I've been working even before I joined McLean with battery electric vehicles since about 2015. My background is that I'm a mining engineer. Uh, and I can, I was involved with the first version for a little bit, and now I joined back in for the third revision. Um, and like Anders said, I'm sure there will be revision four, five, six, um, you know, et cetera, uh, as, the, uh, as it changes. So one of the things that we kind of cleaned up a little bit in this version is um, the language around the business case. Um, so in version two, I would say it was very specific and it had some examples in there that are also very specific to one particular operation or project. Um, so rather than delving into a specific case, we turned it more into a checklist of things to consider as you consider battery electric vehicles for your project or operation. So no two projects or operations are created the same. I think we all know that. Um, every application is a little bit differently. And so the benefits are also uh, different from project to project or operation to operation. And so rather than 
spelling out exactly what the uh, savings and whatever uh, operating costs, let's say, are for for EV, uh, it was much more appropriate to, to provide a guideline or a, a, a checklist, basically, of what to check off against. And out of experience, um, having gone through the board and exercises, the study manager there, it would have been very helpful to have that checklist uh, from study management view um, to see what I should consider that would bring or, um, you know, what the pros and cons are in terms of the value proposition. So um, this is a very good checklist. It, uh, it, um, it and, and it's really on the on the reader to interpret that uh, for their own project. So that's that's really um, what what it's meant for. And so it's divided up in four different um, uh, buckets. So the first one is revenue, second one is capital cost, then we got operating cost, and then uh, health, safety, environment, or environment and community. Uh, and with those four, we are were able to capture um, a lot of different facets um, on what drives the business case. And I'm sure we forgot some. So either we get that in on the comment round right now, or we get that in on Red 4. Um, but this is by no means a final list. So we go to the next slide. And there's a lot to say about mine design. Um, so uh, obviously this might be most um, interesting to mine planners, engineers, uh, people who are operations or uh, in training, um, and of course health and safety personnel at mine sites. Um, we kind of go through it step by step. And again, we're not we're trying to we try to take the parts out that talk about rudimentary mine design. And just focus on the areas that are different in or that should be taken into consideration when looking at electric machines only. Um, so it's it's a bit of a distinction, but we were able to make it more concise and more to the point that way. Um, so the areas that we are uh, going through in this particular section are uh, line mine layout and infrastructure considerations, maintenance areas. What's different with the EVs? Sorry. What do we do with personnel movement and parking in this in particular particular importance with shaft mines um, around shaft stations? How do you lay that out? Uh, of course, then uh, some some things around the mobile electric equipment, um, training, a little bit on fire and battery safety, although a lot of that has its own separate section later on. Uh, as you would expect, a lot of it goes around uh, ventilation because that is uh, is one of the key value drivers uh, in underground mining, at least. Uh, then talk a little bit about the charging infrastructure as it relates to the mine design um, and finishes off with, with the risk assessments. So we go to the next session section. Um, this is, I still have this one, eh, Anders? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, this part is not about how to design a vehicle at all. Uh, I mean, that's why mechanical engineers and electrical engineers do what they do. Uh, but this is just to give an overview on the different components that you will likely find on mobile electric equipment. Uh, so this goes through uh, the braking systems, the high voltage DC system, the low voltage and control system, uh, generic description around fire safety, the drivetrain, um, there's a little chapter about electric and radio interference, shock and vibrations, and then uh, maintenance as well. So this is important for anyone who's curious about how these machines actually work, um, but certainly for, for maintenance personnel who are seeking to understand what's different with, um, with battery electric vehicles, this could be a very helpful uh, section to read through to get the basic knowledge. And I do, do wanna stress that this that does not replace um, training by an OEM, let's say, on the specific equipment, and really should be seen as a, a general overview um, uh, in very generic terms. So, go to the next one. 
And then we got the energy storage systems. Um, so that's really about batteries and everything around the batteries, including uh, a lot of the uh, safety systems, the battery management system, uh, what kind of interlocks there are, what kind of uh, monitoring goes on. Um, and again, interesting for everyone who's uh, curious about this. Um, and again, maybe maybe more so for my maintenance teams and people who are looking at risk assessments. Um, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there's, this is probably one of the more controversial ch chapters to go through uh, in the guideline. Um, a lot of different uh, aspects to consider and a lot of perspectives to try and summarize. And so uh, we really try to come up with a balanced view on an and, um, factual or sort of objective view on what's available um in in most battery systems noting that of course there are differences between different suppliers and, and um uh, i'm not sure if i anders i don't know if you want to add anything to this but uh, no i would say it, it starts from from uh, ions jumping in the lithium ion cells uh, up to the ba battery management system and all this route on a perspective of how to use this on the underground vehicles. Exactly. So, um, yeah, that's that's the part on the uh, energy storage systems, and, and you can see some of the uh, topics that are that are uh, presented in the in that section of the document. The next slide, please. And I believe this is back over to Anders right now. Yeah, uh, I realize I forgot to introduce myself also. Anders Link is working at technolo with technology development at Epiroc. I've been involved in Epiroc's battery journey for almost 10 years and uh, much involved in, uh, in this revision three and revision two of a battery guideline. So charging system, there's off-board charging, on-board charging, battery swap, fast charging, and God knows what type of ways to charge a battery. And that's the reason why there's not only one way, because uh, uh, there are different, different ones that are best in different cases, depending on the machine size, machine type, use case, and so on. So this chapter describe all the possible viable alternatives and pros and cons for them. So by reading this, you can build knowledge. So and with this knowledge, you can decide what's best for your situation. So it's really a school book, not the standard in this case. Uh, and uh, as you, oh, there are different alternatives, and of course also uh, similar machines have different alternatives, but it's all about the use case also. So read this and you understand why there are so many alternatives and what to, to choose for your specific conditions. Can take the next slide. Uh, charging interface, charger connectors, a uh, little bit the same here also. As everything from, from a small AC plug through a CCS interface to an automated fast charger. And there's not one solution that's the best for all situations. So here's also pros and cons for the different alternatives. So read this and you learn, both OEMs and mining companies learn what, to, what is the best for each situation. Uh, yeah, you can take the next slide. Performance standard, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, describe a standardized way of describing performance, such as range on battery, for example. Uh, so if OEMs use that way, when they describe the performance in a similar way, or hopefully same way, and that makes <clears throat> mining companies and mining engineers to be able to compare apples to apples. So they really can see which is best in this situation instead of comparing apples to, to oranges that it is today. So I think this was the last slide in the section about what, what, what the content is. So this was 120 pages in 15 minutes. So now I'll leave yeah. it back to EMD again. <laughs> All right, so I take over here. Uh, my name's Francine uh, and I'm the technical publications manager here. So 
I'll go through a little bit about where we're at in the process of this guideline, just since some people are probably this is their first time with GMG, but I also see a lot of people who've been involved in this version, people who've been involved in past versions who are here. So just to give everyone an update. Uh, so you would have probably seen the review uh, message that recently went out. Uh, we're in working group review. So this is where we look for broad input to validate the nearly finished guidelines. So we're uh, looking for accuracy, making sure everything in there is accurate, clarity, value, making sure what's in there is valuable to the industry. Uh, like um, Anders mentioned, it's it's really to make sure things are good, not that they're a standard or a, a perfect uh, document. So um, at this stage, it's it's uh, nearly finished. Um, and just one second. <laughs> okay, what's on the slide? Um, yeah, so I just, oh, we also provide a little bit of information here for those of you who might be new to GMG guidelines. We did conduct a survey a couple uh, years ago about how people are actually using them. So there's a wide range of ways they're being used for education, as Anders mentioned, reference to help people build their operational procedures, all kinds of support functions that these guidelines have. Uh, for our readers and uh, they're really experience based. So it's they're written by the industry for the industry. That's the sort of overall. Uh, way these are written um, so we can go to the next yeah. slide. Yeah, Francine, just to quickly jump in, I forgot to say this is not the standard, but we are all referring to standards a lot. So if you read the guideline, then you can see what standard you should look at. Mm -hmm. It's a really important part of the guideline through all the, throughout the guideline. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you. That's all right. It's a good point. All right, we can go to the next slide. So this slide just shows the whole process from start to finish of one of these projects. And so you can see we're close to the end. Fin uh, technical editing, layout and final review. We're in final review. So uh, that means so what usually happens here is uh, Everyone receives the guideline, the comment form. I think there's a few people on this call who've already actually submitted their comment forms, so you're already familiar with that. Uh, then those comments are all kind of they're brought together and then they're confirmed by the uh, project steering committee. So the committee that Martin and Anders and I think some other people on here are on. Uh, and then uh, all approved updates are edited into the guideline and then some comments might be set aside for future editions or even separate projects. So if there's something that's out of scope of this guideline, but you want to say this should be covered by uh, GMG or you think it's a really good topic, it can be brought forward into the working group as well. So uh, even if your comments aren't treated in this guideline, they will be considered for uh, the future. And that's overall what I have on the review process. Um, but if anyone has any questions, I think we can open up to that 